Marco has a, a PhD from NYU in mathematics, right? And uh, he's been with IBM Research for almost 20 years now. And he's a master inventor, has lots and lots of patents. So, credit for researcher. Now he's a second line manager there. Uh, has lots of papers, lots of best paper awards and awards uh, at IBM and outside. So, uh, to welcome him here. To of uh, uh, program analysis for security enforcement. Uh, there's a mute button at the top. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear my, my own voice now. Uh, so um, in this uh, talk, I will talk, I will present uh, some of the work that we have done in the area of uh, uh, program analysis for security. Uh, with the purpose of uh, uh, keeping the analysis sound, but at the same time making it scalable. And uh, uh, in, a, in spite of having done all this work, we were still struggling with a lot of false positives. And so for this reason, we now um, uh, found a very nice solution that integrates uh, the program analysis that we do for security with machine learning in order to reduce the number of, uh, uh, of false positives. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who have collaborated with me on uh, this work. Um, my uh, colleague Om uh, colleagues, Omer Tripp, Salvatore Guarnieri, and Alexander Al Arapkin from IBM, and uh, Patrick Radia Um So the, um, I would like to give just a brief motivation for people who uh, may not be so familiar with uh, uh, the security challenges that uh, uh, companies uh, are facing today. And in particular, I come from an industrial background, so um, this work has been motivated by uh, the problems brought to IBM by customers or problems that the uh, security uh, division in IBM, uh, as a division that creates products, had to face and solve. So uh, often they came to us asking, uh, how can we solve this problem? How can we make the analysis? Uh, sound, but at the same time uh, more scalable. So there is a strong motivation coming from uh, real industrial problems that I would like to share with you. Um, so uh, there is a consortium of companies and uh, academic institutions called the OWASP, which stands for Open Web Application Security Projects. Um, every, every year, the OWASP uh, puts together a list of uh, uh, what are considered like the top 10 security vulnerabilities. Uh, in this case, it's uh, uh, 12, but it's because I merged the, the uh, security vulnerabilities for web applications and the security vulnerabilities for mobile applications. Um, and um, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, the, uh, these vulnerabilities can be you know, grouped into three different uh, categories, information flow, access control, and configuration. And uh, as you can see, the red ones are the ones related to access to information flow, and they are the ones that I'm going to uh, uh, to discuss today because they are, these are the ones that we're trying to resolve with our tool. So in particular, for example, uh, there are the injection vulnerabilities. Um, like uh, this, this injection vulnerabilities, you guys are familiar probably with this uh, attack, like uh, you have a, uh, like a, a form uh, and people are supposed to enter, say, the user ID and password, but uh, a maliciously crafted string can be uh, concatenated with uh, other uh, strings that are hard-coded into the program and form a um, malicious SQL uh, query. So if something like that happens, you can pretty much uh, uh, compromise the integrity of the database or uh, break the confidentiality of the database. Um, Sony, uh, the company Sony was uh, a victim of this attack and uh, um, in 2011, 77 million uh, PlayStation Network accounts were hacked. Uh, uh, like it, it, it was a, such a big loss that uh, fortunately Sony is a big company was able to sustain uh, the loss, but other companies would have uh, gone out of business. Um, another vulnerability that is also very common is uh, cross-site scripting, uh, which uh, uh, happens every time an attacker can inject the JavaScript code wherever normal text is expected because JavaScript code is indeed uh, text. So the problem is instead of being rendered by the browser, it's gonna be executed. 
So um, uh, in this case, the uh, the victim, uh, the, the maybe one of the most famous victims, because like these attacks are so common that uh, it's almost impossible to count all the companies that have been affected. But in this case, it was eBay. Uh, again, it was a major vulnerability. Um, an another um, attack that almost uh, uh, you know brought uh, the Home Depot down was a sensitive data, ex sensitive data exposure. In this case, credit card uh, information from uh, customers was released and uh, um, the company lost uh, about 62 millions. It's not just a, a matter of uh, money, but also a matter of reputation. So many companies uh, see their reputation completely compromised when something like this happens. So it's not just, uh, it's so easy to quantify the loss. The loss is more than just uh, the money uh, that you can count. Um, another uh, vulnerability that is related to information flow security is cross-site request forgery. Uh, this happens when a user has already authenticated and now um, a malicious uh, attack uses the authentication session of the user to perform uh, malicious operations. In this case, uh, Facebook itself was, I think, attacked uh, back in 2014. Actually, maybe it was not attacked, but they, they discovered that this vulnerability was there and they fixed it before it was too late. Um, and then we have, uh, in 2006, uh, uh, a company uh, called um, Goldleaf um, attacked by unvalidated redirection forwards. This is actually very common. Uh, it happens when uh, an attacker can redirect uh, a user to go to a different web page that perhaps looks exactly like the web page that the user expects to see. Uh, so the user doesn't understand that it's now uh, on a replica, a malicious replica of the website that uh, the user expects to see. Um, and in particular, here you see that two frameworks, OAuth and OpenID, these are very common frameworks also used in mobile applications, uh, were also victim of this attack. So any, uh, any application that used those frameworks was also vulnerable to unvalidated um, redirects and forwards. And finally, um, Snapchat was a victim of unintended data leakage to the point that uh, they had to um, delink uh, uh, de um, telephone numbers from the mobile application in order to uh, prevent a major loss. So um, how do we solve this problem? Um, we, our approach has been to use program analysis in order to enforce uh, information flow security. Um, there are two uh, uh, approaches, two major approaches that have been taken, type systems uh, and uh, program slicing. Um, type systems are uh, complex, uh, they are conservative, uh, and also they require uh, code annotations, which is so basically becomes cumbersome, especially if uh, the code is not owned by a company, uh, you also need to have developers who understand security. So it's an, an approach that has not been very successful in the industry. And there is also classic slicing. Classic slicing ha ha has the disadvantage of uh, uh, not being scalable if you want to make it very precise. So this basically leads us to uh, a major um, you know, uh, conflict that everybody faces when uh, they want to use program analysis on a large code. There is a, like a, um, a conflict between the precision and scalability. If you want the analysis to be very precise, sometimes you have to sacrifice the scalability. Or if you want the analysis to be very scalable, you have to sacrifice precision. How do we find uh, the right balance? Um, so uh, originally we uh, wrote a paper, uh, uh, and actually this became a part of an IBM product, uh, TAJ, Taint Analysis for Java. We presented it at PLDI 2009. I just wanted to tell you a little bit what we did here. Um, we had uh, a pointer analysis that was a, vari a variant of uh, Anderson's analysis. The analysis was uh, field sensitive. In terms of flow sensitivity, it was in um, intra-procedurally flow sensitive, which means that we took into account uh, strong updates as long as they happen inside the same, inside the same procedure, but inter-procedurally was flow insensitive. And then we had uh, a very uh, complicated context sensitivity policy um, that was completely built uh, based on experience. So we started, first we had like a, uh, a context sensitivity, the analysis was, was, was con context insensitive. Then we said this b b becomes too imprecise. So let's add the context sensitivity 
how many levels of context sensitivity should we add? Uh, so we started to play with all these parameters and eventually we came up with a solution that worked, but uh, um, it, it was, it's very hard to replicate that solution, say, as soon as we move to a different language, as soon as people started to introduce frameworks, uh, and eventually the analysis became kind of unsound because in order to scale uh, to large programs, uh, the people in the product division inserted certain bounds uh, and uh, uh, we were not satisfied with this approach. As Professor Cousseau said today, when, when you start making unsound assumptions, it's no longer uh, an approach that uh, scientists uh, will be satisfied with. So that's actually when we started to collaborate uh, with Patrick and Radia Cousseau and we pr uh, produced the Andromeda uh, work, uh, which was published at FACE 2013. Um, so the idea was the following. Uh, we First we realized that web applications and now also mobile applications are large and complex, much more larger than uh, people would imagine because if you wanted the analysis to be sound, you have to include in the analysis scope also the libraries, the supporting libraries and frameworks. Um, and of course, there is the usual, uh, the usual conflict between uh, making uh, the analysis sound. In that case, you have to uh, make it precise if, if you want it to be usable, but then it doesn't scale well. You can make the analysis unsound, uh, but then you will have false negatives. So we needed to you know, uh, make a decision here. And our goal was to make the analysis sound and at the same time, a precise and scalable. It looks almost like a dream uh, to make that uh, happen. But uh, we also realized one important thing. Uh, we're dealing here with uh, a very sp specific analysis. It's information flow security analysis. It's not that we're doing like uh, a general static analysis framework. So uh, the intuition is that uh, information flow security analysis, which deals with integrity and confidentiality uh, problems inside code, um, is a very sparse problem. Uh, in the sense that if you take uh, a static representation of the program, perhaps you realize that uh, uh, the parts of the program that are affected by uh, the propagation of uh, taint information or the propagation of confidential information are really uh, small compared to the entire program itself. So um, one of the reasons why uh, traditional approaches uh, for for information flow security analysis didn't work before, it was that uh, these approaches try to uh, model the entire program and, and build a mathematical model of the entire program. And uh, uh, this may be completely unnecessary because the parts of the program that are affected by the chain propagation are much smaller than the, enti of, uh, than the entire program itself. So um, we wanted, therefore, to take advantage of this intuition and make the analysis lazy in the sense that uh, we don't really pre-compute a lot of information, but we compute the minimal information that we need, and then we go deeper only in the places where precision is needed. So this actually uh, proved to be the right intuition. As a matter of fact, we um, were able to do this work included into the uh, product called uh, IBM, Secu uh, IBM Security App Scan Source Edition, which is the major uh, st static analysis for security pr uh, product that IBM produces. And we published a bunch of papers. Uh, we, we did also the work on the JavaScript, uh, integration with frameworks, uh, integration with string analysis, and also uh, uh, integration with uh, Android uh, uh, in collaboration with Bibak Sarkar and his team. Um, so um, in, in particular, I wanted to mention what are the contributions. So uh, Andromeda uh, is um, scalable analysis uh, and it's also demand driven. So as I mentioned before, it, it's not really necessary to pre-compute a large uh, uh, model for the entire program, but we can focus only where uh, the precision is needed. Um, and uh, um, the analysis is modular and incremental. So um, this actually allows for reusing existing uh, artifacts that were computed before. And in particular, since the analysis is incremental, it can be integrated, which we actually did, integrated into an IDE tool. So you, you type, a developer writes code, 
runs the analysis, then makes corrections, writes other code, and then when the analysis is rerun, it reruns in a matter of seconds because uh, the analysis is incremental, and so it only uh, recomputes things that are affected by the changes performed by the developer. Uh, no, uh, thank you for the question. I should have uh, clarified this at the beginning. So uh, we uh, only uh, considered uh, data flow, but not control flow. And in particular, we don't consider uh, indirect uh, uh, flows. The reason is that, I mean, we have the, um, the, the framework for doing that. At the beginning, we, we did that. But then we realized that pretty much, if we consider, uh, if you consider uh, indirect flows, which are the flows that happen in the conditional statements, for example, then uh, the entire program is tainted. And the reason is exceptions, like um, uh, potentially any instruction, uh, any instruction is control dependent on the previous instruction, because the previous instruction could have, thrown, could have thrown an exception and could have prevented the current instruction from being executed. So in that case, assignments won't happen and things like that. So taint propagates all over the place and the, 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 a developer would be uh, overwhelmed with false positives and uh, the analysis would become unusable. So when I said that we wanted, uh, thank you very much, I, I forgot to mention this because indeed when we said that the analysis is sound, I should have said the modulo um, control flow dependencies um, in, in, in direct flows. Um, but let's look at this example. So. Um, uh, I wanted to give you an intuition of uh, how uh, this demand-driven analysis works. So, um, first of all, um, we need to know, so first of all, we need to know uh, what is going on in the entire program. So a first pass through the entire program is necessary. I said before, remember that I said like we need, we just want to focus on things that are relevant to information flow security. But the problem is, for example, let's take uh, this instruction. This is an instruction in which potentially a tainted value is entering the program because the user is typing uh, his or her name in a form, and so that can be, say, a SQL injection problem. So how, do we, how would we know, for example, that this instruction even exists in the program if we hadn't scanned and built a call graph and so on? So um, the first thing we need to is to build a call graph. Um, and um, um, in this case, we detect, for example, the name is a, a tainted variable because it's the result of something that we call a source. So there is now a source coming, in, a source of taint coming into the program. Uh, now, um, we follow the propagation. We do a diffuse analysis inside this method, and we see that, um, for example, taint propagates now to this variable buff, which is a string buffer, and um, um, and buff is basically uh, coming from a parameter. Um, and uh, if we look at this, like just looking at this analysis of this procedure, we might think that there is no security problem here because um, there is a sync, there is a security sensitive operation. So uh, sources are uh, methods like uh, request.getParameter. This is where taint comes into the program. So there is a source here. Um, this, ma this variable is tainted, which causes this to be tainted, this to be tainted, and this to be tainted. And this is where um, the security sensitive operation occurs. So in this situation, this is a cross-site scripting uh, sync. This is where uh, uh, an attacker could potentially print the JavaScript code on the browser, causing the JavaScript code to be executed. But uh, what is being printed is buff2, not buff. So this seems to be uh, fine. But in reality, it isn't fine, because if we go back uh, to where buff is coming from, um, it's coming from another, coming from another procedure, and uh, we see that um, it is actually passed uh, as a parameter number one and parameter number two. So now this buff two also is tainted, which causes the sync to be reached. And so this is actually a problem. So if we hadn't gone back to the procedure where buff uh, uh, is coming from, we would have never known that uh, um, there was a taint propagation to, uh, to take into account. So this shows us the need for doing interprocedural uh, aliasing analysis. Um, having said that, I just want to give you a quick uh, overview of the algorithm. 
Um, so first, uh, we take uh, uh, as an input, of course, all the code of the application, and also we need uh, the, the security rules. Uh, in other words, uh, what I showed you before, there is a source, there is a sync, and, and this is a source for cross scripting, this is a sync for cross scripting, um, and uh, this flows of uh, information flow can be sanitized. So uh, if there is something that is a cross scripting um, potential, a string that could cause cross scripting, it's not necessarily the case that the program should be uh, you know, banned from running because, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be able to run any application. So what happens is that uh, developers are supposed to sanitize the strings. So we need we need to have uh, these three bolts, and uh, uh, this is an input that we get uh, from uh, the security experts. So IBM has indeed a, a team of security experts, and these people gave us these rules. Uh, the second step is to build the class hierarchy, and then we built uh, a class hierarchy uh, call graph, CHA. Uh, the reason why, first of all, the reason why we need a call graph is that if we didn't have a call graph, we wouldn't even be able to know the sources and the sinks and the sanitizers that are there in the program. So a call graph is necessary just to compute reachability inside the program. We also need to go back to the predecessor methods. You remember in the example I showed you before, if we hadn't gone back to the predecessor method, we wouldn't have learned about the aliasing relation between the two parameters. So in order to go back, we need a call graph. So uh, this is one of those things that are kind of unavoidable. So if you really want to have a demand-driven analysis, uh, you in, in our case, we built the cheapest call graph that we could ever build, but we need a call graph, and then we go deeper uh, based on tame propagation. Um, one cheap uh, improvement over CHA is that we did uh, uh, intra-procedural type inference. So that actually added a lot of precision uh, without having to waste uh, a lot of energy. Um, then we perform a data flow analysis, uh, which I will explain in a moment, and uh, we will report any flow from a source to a sink that is not intercepted by a sanitizer. Um, so uh, th the way we proceed is that we build uh, an abstract domain consisting of triplets. Uh, we have um, um, a method, a variable inside the method, and an access path. So the access path are also uh, forming um, lat a lattice uh, in a very intuitive uh, way. Um, and uh, this way uh, we can pretty much, for example, uh, understand uh, how deep a taint is nested inside uh, uh, an access path. Um, and as I said, the analysis is modular uh, because um, uh, for every method, uh, we can uh, compute, uh, we can compute a, a kind of something called a rule in the sense that if uh, we have a method and a particular access path rooted at a given uh, parameter, and we know that this is tainted, uh, and suppose that we have computed that uh, another parameter gets tainted as a result of uh, that entry, we can just store this rule and uh, reapply it uh, when um, uh, this method is called. Uh, here is an example. Suppose we have method M, and the second parameter, B2, um, is tainted, not really B2, but B2.f.g. So suppose that uh, B2.f.g is tainted, and doing our analysis, we come to the conclusion that based on this, uh, on this hypothesis, V1.h, another field in another parameter, is tainted. Um, so computing this rule requires perhaps a lot of work. But the next time that the analysis encounters this precondition, we don't need to recompute the whole thing. We just know that this is true, and we can reapply it. Um, so um, the way um, the way this works is uh, let me give you like um, an example. Like, uh, these yellow uh, nodes are methods, and inside the methods we see all the statements. So first we uh, identify a source, which means like where uh, where taint comes into the program or it could be taint, or it could be confidential information. Um, and uh, um, the, the red, the red uh, dot is a tainted variable inside a given uh, instruction, inside a given method. 
And then based on that, we, pro uh, we do a def def use analysis and we start computing all the other variables inside the method that are tainted as a result of that variable being tainted. Um, it may be necessary, of course, to, to go into a different method because our analysis is interprocedural. So uh, maybe there is a, a method call here. And so because of this method call, these two parameters, uh, these two parameters become tainted in this particular context, of course. If this method is called under another context from another method where these two parameters are not tainted, we don't have to, uh, to propagate taints. Um, so the analysis context sensitive. Um, and then we proceed uh, and we continue tainting um, variables. And the interesting thing is that once we have learned, as I mentioned before, once we have learned uh, um, that, um, for example, we have a situation in which this variable, is, this parameter is tainted, and then do, do doing our analysis, we come to the conclusion that this other parameter is tainted as well. We can completely forget what we did here. We can just record this rule at this level, and then we can propagate this rule up to the caller. And, uh, um, and so now uh, um, we, have a, we have a relation between these two parameters, these two variables at this level because of what we have learned in the colli. Um, the analysis then can proceed. Perhaps we have to go back to um, another procedure uh, doing um, uh, aliasing and uh, um, like I did before when I showed you the example with uh, buff and buff2, we need to go back to the uh, caller. Um, okay, uh, at the end of the propagation, we can completely forget about uh, the, uh, the um, model that we built, you know, the call graph, uh, the variables, the um, depth to use analysis that we performed. What remains uh, in our interest is this propagation of, uh, uh, of taint that we have computed. Um, and uh, uh, an interesting thing is that this allows the analysis to be modular. Because, for example, at this point, if we take one of the methods that we analyzed before, as I mentioned, we learned that uh, because this, this parameter was tainted, another one was tainted, we can record uh, this information and uh, um, store it. And the next time we are in a situation in which uh, an application calls that particular method, um, we don't have to recompute what we computed before in the library. This is information that we have learned before and it doesn't need to be recomputed again. So um, if we see that there is a flow from this method from this variable into this parameter. This method doesn't need to be reanalyzed. We learned this information before, we can simply propagate it to, um, to the caller. And the analysis then proceeds as we saw before. Um, there is also the need for backward propagation, as I mentioned before. Um, so for example, suppose that we have uh, two calls at, uh, in method M1, there is a call to method M3. And in method M2, also there is a call to method M3. So um, these are two different calls to the same method. Um, this is with parameters X1 and X2, uh, and these are with parameters Y1 and uh, Y2. Um, so um, suppose that uh, we have learned that X1 uh, dot F dot G if this is tainted, then x2.h is tainted, then we can uh, come to the same conclusion uh, for the second method call, assuming, of course, that y1.f.g is tainted. If this is not tainted, we don't need to apply this rule. So that's what I mean when I say that the analysis is context sensitive. And finally, uh, the analysis is incremental because um, once we have learned, uh, for example, these uh, um, taint constraints, like for example, that uh, a given variable, a given access path is tainted, causes another access path from being tainted. Um, and then uh, there is a kind of uh, um, uh, a graph, basically, like which records how constraints were learned. 
So for example, we learned a given constraint, and this causes other constraints to be learned and so on. So uh, if, the, if the developer is changing the code, for example, adding a new class, changing a method, uh, adding a new source, adding a new sync, a call to a source, a call to a sync into the program. So uh, it's not necessary to um, recompute the entire analysis. We simply have to um, see which code uh, changed. For example, something changed, we have to uh, invalidate it. This doesn't hold anymore because there was a change that was performed in the program. But now since this doesn't hold, uh, this other fact doesn't hold either. We need to invalidate that too. And this is it at this point. We cannot unval invalidate anything else because these other two facts are still holding because of this one. So basically, we perform a change impact analysis. Based on the change performed by the user, by the developer, <coughs> we, compute what need, we compute what needs to be reanalyzed. And then we proceed again to a fixed point. Um, so, um, uh, by the way, I just want to mention uh, the, um, the results were incredibly good in the sense that when uh, the incremental analysis is activated, it takes uh, literally uh, seconds, like one, two seconds uh, for every, so we basically found, uh, we basically identified the major changes, like adding a class, adding a method, adding a source, or deleting a sync, you know, uh, we described all of this in the paper and it took about one or two seconds uh, for each uh, atomic change Assuming that uh, uh, changes were applied atomically, it takes a, a matter of f a few seconds for the analysis to be recomputed. So this actually allowed us to create an analysis that is scalable and at the same time uh, um, uh, precise. Um, now, af after having done uh, all this work, however, we still, uh, so the analysis is sound, modulo, indirect flows, and scalable, but we were still uh, struggling with false positives. So that's when we decided to integrate this uh, analysis with machine learning. Um, so um, um, in particular, I wanted to uh, uh, mention what we did. So we created a solution that uh, is static analysis engine independent. So our machine learning solution doesn't depend on the particular static analyzer. So we, yes, we did integrate the machine learning with Andromeda, with the static analyzer, but we could have integrated it with any other static analyzer. The only request that we have is that the static analyzer produces not just uh, a flag saying this is tainted, uh, there is an issue, but also shows you um, the reason why taint propagation is there. For example, here we have uh, a source and then uh, um, propagating statement and then uh, uh, a call to a sync. So we need to know not just that there is a, uh, a flow from uh, this source to this sink, but also the path that led uh, from uh, uh, that source to that particular sink. So we, ex we expect the analyzer to give us this information, and most analyzers do, because without giving the path to the user, there would be nothing that the developer could do anyway. Um, we also want to know, for example, how much time uh, was spent for a particular issue to be found, for example, like maybe d finding this took uh, uh, one second or something that we need to know how much time it took. Um, and um, why do we have so many false positives? Well, there are, there are three major dimensions of uh, imprecision, I would say, as opposed to the title here, dimension of precision. One is flow insensitivity. For example, let's take this statement. Here we have that x dot f is a tainted uh, access path because it's reading something, say, from uh, a source. Uh, later on in the program, there is an assignment to the empty string. So if we were doing, uh, if our analysis were completely flow sensitive, we would take into account that there is a strong update here, and uh, at this point, we wouldn't report this as a potential violation. This is a, a cross-site scripting uh, sync. We would not report this as a violation, but unfortunately, we our analysis has to be flow insensitive for many reasons, including the fact that sometimes we cannot really disambiguate with instru which instruction is ex executed first. Um, so um, we report this as an issue. Another one is path insensitivity. So here we have, uh, for example, that originally x dot f is the empty string. Then uh, uh, under a Boolean condition b, 
um, XLF becomes tainted. And uh, uh, in the case in which uh, B is false, um, we write uh, uh, XLF uh, to the browser. So it means uh, this is a potential cross-site scripting sync. But these two conditions are mutually exclusive. They will never happen at the same time. But since our analysis is path insensitive, we consider both of them uh, executable uh, um, in the program. And so we would report this as an issue. And third, uh, the, uh, there is the issue of context insensitivity. For example, um, many analyses are context insensitive. Um, this is the identity function. So um, x, uh, y1 is, is pretty much x. However, there is also y2, uh, which is uh, uh, tainted. y2 is tainted because it's uh, something that is read from uh, a source. Um, and then suppose that we write uh, y1. Uh, so this is a potential sync because it we're writing to the browser. Now, if we consider, if the analysis is context insensitive, we would see that there is a call to ID, to the, uh, to the identity function that uh, uh, leads to propagation of taint. So uh, just because of this, we would consider Y1 to be tainted as well, and we would report this as tainted. Now, our analysis Andromeda doesn't suffer from this problem because it's context sensitive, but other analyzers do suffer from uh, context insensitivity uh, in precision. So um, there was a paper published at XC 2013. Why don't software developers use the static analysis tools to find bugs? And the answer is too many false positives. So developers basically uh, claimed, many developers claimed that, uh, and they still do that, they claim that um, they prefer to keep their code uh, potentially vulnerable because when they are presented with an analysis that has an overwhelming result, an overwhelming amount of uh, uh, false uh, positives, the time spent to, um, to disambiguate the false positives from the true positive is prohibitive. And they don't want to go through that uh, exercise. It's too expensive and too boring and everything. So they just don't want to do it. So uh, the, the secret, the trick is to make the analysis appealing to the developer and presenting the developer with uh, results that are true and the developer is impressed and the, the developer fixes the results without uh, feeling that they're wasting their time. So um, we um, created a tool for this to eliminate, to reduce the amount of false positives. The tool is called Aletheia, which is a Greek uh, word. Aletheia is the goddess of uh, truth. Um, so uh, we want to give it the true positives, basically, and that's why we gave them this name to the tool. Um, and uh, as I said, this uh, works with any static security analysis. So it doesn't just work with the one that we created. Um, and just to give you an evaluation right away, uh, we took uh, um, about 1,700 HTML pages taken from uh, uh, the top uh, 675 top popular websites according to alexa.com, and uh, we got uh, a total of 3,758 uh, warnings from uh, the analysis. Uh, and uh, we had uh, a team of uh, developers. Uh, they looked at all the warnings, uh, one by one. So at this point, we had uh, a complete classification of which warning was a true positive, or which one was a false positive. And uh, um, um, so all of them were looked at, so that at this point, we could actually run our experiments. But then we assume that uh, only 200 are, are uh, the ones classified. So we expect like uh, a developer to only have to look at 200 um, issues. And based on the, uh, the uh, response that the developer gives to us on only these on 200 issues, we were able to learn uh, using machine learning, we were able to learn uh, um, how to distinguish uh, false positives from true positives. Um, and also we, uh, we wanted to, like in a sense, make happy both people who are uh, interested in preserving true positives and uh, people that actually want to reduce the false uh, negatives. Um, 
sorry, false party. So we want to basically, uh, we want, there are some people that are biased towards preservation of true positives. They want the analysis to be as sound as possible. Uh, so they, they can actually be more, uh, you know, ac they, they can accept uh, spending a little bit more time on the false positives as long as they feel confident that the analysis doesn't discard uh, too many true positives. So we have a precision improvement of uh, uh, two point, uh, of a factor of 2.868 and I recall degradation of only um, one, uh, 1.006. And uh, if uh, the policy is biased towards reducing false alarms, you see the results are really uh, dramatic. So um, let me tell you uh, how this works. So um, uh, the input is all, uh, so we expect the tool to receive as an input all the uh, warnings, all of them. And then uh, there is about, uh, we expect 200 classified warnings. Um, so each warning is uh, paired to a Boolean value which says true or false. Uh, and then um, um, the, um, the tool will up output a classified subset of uh, all the warnings, say which are uh, true, which are uh, false. Uh, the way this works is that, uh, I will populate this slide uh, completely. Um, so the way this works is that uh, um, basically we take uh, uh, the analysis engine the static analyzer, we make it run, and this produces all the possible results that the analysis would uh, produce normally. There is, no, there is no machine learning yet. Then the user classifies a subset of those results, and uh, we uh, extract uh, some features, and then we run uh, the machine learning uh, tool, and at this point we have a, clen like a cleansed uh, uh, output that uh, uh, clearly separates uh, the true positives and only reports the true positives according to the analysis basically and filters out the false uh, the false positives of course there can be some errors here at this point uh, we lose like the soundness because we are using machine learning but uh, uh, again being an industrial tool and being that the static analysis is sound um, we are confident that we are doing something useful for developers because as i said before even with this xc paper that was published in 2013 uh, if we want to really improve the quality of today's software, we need to somehow find a compromise, otherwise developers will not even use our tool. So um, the features basically consist of uh, um, a bunch of things that are extracted from uh, the static analysis output. Here I list just a few of them, but I will show you the full thing in a second. So we have the length of the flow, for example. How long is the flow from a source to a sink? How much time was it necessary to compute it, uh, what is the line number of the source, and so on. And then we can say true, false, true, like uh, um, the developer uh, classifies 200 of these issues and we provide the, the rest of the information. So um, I'll go very fast here. Uh, I, I forget how much uh, uh, time, very soon. So we have, uh, I, I'm pretty much done, but uh, I just wanted to say we have uh, three um, families of uh, features, lexical, quantitative, and security. So the lexical uh, features are those that are pretty much uh, um, like um, um, things that can be learned from the source code of the program, like for example, the source and sync identifiers, um, the line numbers, the URLs, and the what type of protocol is being used, for example, May2 and so on. Um, by the way, there was a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of experiments that we ran because these features had to be extracted very carefully. F f extracting features randomly, we noticed that we just confused uh, the analysis completely. Then there are the quantitative uh, um, features, like for example, the cardinality of the results. Uh, if, uh, suppose, for example, you have a, a library that for some reason seems to have a lot of bugs. So this can be, a f uh, we learned that uh, through machine learning and also through our evaluation of the results, we just learned that this is most likely a false positive, a, a bunch of false positives embedded there because it's not really common to see all these bugs embedded into uh, one library. I mean, it's really unrealistic. Um, like the, the cardinality of the steps, how much time it took, 
uh, and uh, how many path conditions were encountered. Again, the more path conditions are there, the more likely you have false positives. Because as I showed you before in the example, path conditions is a source of, uh, of uh, uh, conserv conservativity. And finally, um, we have uh, certain security rules, for example, DOM-based cross-site scripting and the severity level that uh, may also influence the likelihood of uh, an issue to be true or false. So by putting all together, everything together, we, uh, we decided that these were the right features. And then uh, um, we um, uh, used, uh, we, we have to give the results to the classifier. So the classifier at this point has to compute based on all the results, has to compute the true, ne the true positives and uh, eliminate the, what the classifier believes are the, um, the false positives. And so in this case, we actually um, found, uh, uh, we used Weka, uh, library for machine learning, and uh, um, uh, we used uh, four families of uh, learning alg algorithms. And uh, the idea is the following. Basically, we gave uh, the user the ability to tell us if the user is biased more towards preserving true positives or uh, eliminating false positives. So based on that, we the analysis uh, runs all the classifiers and then chooses the ones that uh, uh, match the preference of the user. So, um, so last year. Um, okay, so um, the user basically um, has the potential for choosing between uh, uh, precision and recall. And uh, um, we, we compute a score function that uh, allows us to choose the best algorithm, the best machine learning algorithm for, uh, making, the for making the user happy in the sense that the user really finds what they expect to see. Um, so based on our evaluation, as I mentioned before, we had, uh, more, we had almost 4,000 classified warnings and um, um, all of them were classified but then we uh, randomly chose 200 of them as the learning uh, set for the tool. Um, and then we uh, made an average across 10 runs. Uh, basically, we, um, we found uh, the results that I mentioned before, like a, a strong improvement in terms of uh, precision and recall. Um, and uh, we found the three conclusions, basically, that based on the tolerable user effort, it is possible to filter the uh, remaining war warnings effectively. So uh, tolerable in our uh, language means that uh, we expect the developer to manually review 200 issues. This is a tolerable effort. Uh, it takes, say, maybe one day of work to review 200 issues. And uh, um, um, Effectively means that uh, the filter achieves at least 95% accuracy. The second uh, conclusion is that uh, none of the classification algorithms used by itself is, uh, is perfect. So we need to actually do what we did. Like we, we proved uh, empirically that uh, uh, combining all these algorithms and choosing the best one dynamically was the best approach. And the third uh, conclusion is that uh, um, uh, um, uh, if we decided to, uh, if, the, if uh, the developer decided to manually review more than 200 results, uh, there is a very slight improvement, but not as big as you would see at the beginning. So um, 200 seems to be like uh, a, a very reasonable number that achieves the optimal uh, result. Uh, going above that, like continuing to review uh, issues doesn't really add much to the final result of the analysis. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to mention this was integrated into a, a product. So it was a, you know, a big uh, satisfaction for us to see that our work was integ integrated into the pr a product, both the static analyzer and the machine learning component. Um, in the future, we would like to experiment with more learning algorithms. And finally, we would like to um, integrate the machine learning within the static analysis algorithm, as opposed to just looking at the results. Perhaps that will lead to more interesting uh, conclusions. And this concludes my talk. Thank you very much.
I think that uh, <laughs> some programmers do a lot of errors and you should concentrate on them. And the machine learning could designate the few <laughs> that... Uh, That's a great idea. <laughs> That's a very good idea, actually. Maybe we can do it because now, like, you know, as part of the header of a program, a programmer has to write uh, uh, his or her name. So we can extract it. <laughs> I have a question first on the first part that was the analysis. So nowadays there is a uh, flow droid that claims to do the same thing as you do except a bit later. So what is the main difference between your analysis and flow yes. droid? So um, I think our analysis, uh, for example, the, um, the learning part takes a very short uh, time for us. Uh, I think for flow droid it takes uh, um, like a very long time. I think they said like maybe a month before they were able to analyze the whole thing using a machine with 96 gigabytes. You know, uh, our our learning phase takes uh, um, you know a very short time overall. Uh, so that's a, a different. That's one um, one of the differences. Uh, he, he, I, I have a question about the machine learning. So have you thought of doing something like bandit problem where users like are given one by one the warnings? Ah, yes. predict uh, and then the, the, yes. the classifier gets better with everything. Exactly. Yes, we actually, uh, that's part of our future work, to make the analysis interactive, so that basically you can uh, imagine a situation in which the user keeps adding input to the learning, uh, and that uh, automatically improves the result. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.